Today we're going to announce that under certain circumstances, liquid water has been found on Mars. Mars is back in the news with evidence that liquid water may still flow on the red planet. We Earthlings are quite fascinated with the cosmos and in particular with the planet most closely resembling our own, Mars. Well, how much have we learned about Mars? What remains important to know? And will there ever be a human colony living there or even further out in the galaxy? Welcome to McGill Talks Mars and Stars. I'm Jackie Rourke. Joining me are four researchers from McGill who go to far-flung places to learn more about the universe we live in. Wayne Pollard is a permafrost geomorphologist in the Department of Geography. He's director of the McGill Arctic Research Station, aka Mars. And according to Canadian Geographic magazine, Wayne Pollard is one of Canada's greatest explorers 2015. Lyle White is an associate professor in the Department of Natural Resource Sciences at McGill. He is a member of the ExoMars 2018 Landing Site Selection Group. His research examines Arctic microbes under Martian environmental conditions. Lyle is also vice chair of the Canadian Astrobiology Network. Richard Leveillet is a planetary scientist and research associate in McGill's Department of Natural Resource Sciences. He's involved in the Mars Science Laboratory as one of 30 NASA-selected participating scientists. He's also part of the science team for SuperCam, one of seven instruments selected for NASA's Mars 2020 rover mission. And Tracy Webb is an associate professor in the Department of Physics at McGill. Her research focuses on the formation and evolution of galaxies. Professor Webb primarily studies galaxies in the very distant and young universe as they existed 5 to 12 billion years ago and can literally watch them form. Fascinating research you all do. Thanks for joining us for McGill Talks. Let's talk Mars and stars. So the latest news about Mars is possibly water flowing on Mars. How important is that? Lyle, you look at that closely. How important is that uh, well, research? Yeah. Um, in my humble opinion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I thought the news from Mars has been over the last, let's say, five or ten years that yes, Mars was, uh, did have water on the surface of Mars and then it all kind of left about 3.5 billion years ago and it's been dry and dead, very dread, uh, dead ever since. So most of the Mars missions that are going right now, as an example, including the one I'm involved in, are there to look for biosignatures or little pieces of evidence of bugs or microbes that were there 3.5 billion years ago or later. So this particular study opens up the door that there are active microbial ecosystems that are potentially on the surface of Mars. And uh, so for me, that's tremendously exciting. And uh, uh, we, we, we have microbes in my lab from the Canadian High Arctic and with, from the Antarctic that grow under very salty, sub-zero conditions. And these are the type of uh, organisms that could potentially also exist on Mars. Now you do a similar kind of research. Well, I'm going to play devil's advocate, Jackie, because awesome. I, I, I think that this is a ploy by NASA just to get publicity. Um, mm. the, the data that's in that paper and, and some of the, the technical content suggests that the activity level, which is really a simple way of saying how accessible that water is, um, is very, very low, much lower than what we see in Antarctica, much lower than what we see in, in the Arctic. And so... Accessibility level, just tell us? Um, essentially how, uh, let's say, bacteria could exploit it, how humans could exploit it, um, how it could be extracted from the environment. The reality is, is probably the greatest source of, of water is still either the, the ice in the ground or the polar ice caps. Um, that's probably the single greatest source of potential water in terms of accessibility. And so a lot of this water that they're talking about, which really is, is only present as, as a, a visible staining of the ground. They don't see liquid water. There's no evidence of, of the water actually flowing. It's the, the, it's the movement of water in the soil uh, fabric. And so are you still skeptical that there's any water? Oh, no, no, no. Um, I think there's lots of places on Mars which water could, could easily exist under very limited time frames. Well, you know, we, we, we know there's water on Mars. Uh, a lot of it is frozen. We, we've known that for some time. And, and so this new finding is saying, well, some of that water may be in a liquid state uh, today. And so, so that, that's the sort of the new twist. Uh, but there's, there's ice caps on Mars that contain a lot of water. There's presumably uh, frozen water in the ground and the subsurface. And uh, uh, a few months ago, the Curiosity rover showed that there's, in typical Mars soil, there's maybe about 2% water attached to minerals that could be theoretically extracted uh, by 
different reactors to, to, to make water, to make oxygen, for instance, for, uh, for human colonies. So, uh, so there is water on Mars. So does this finding have any relationship to someday a human colony? Is there, is there any, or is that even the objective of the research? So no, they're just really looking at uh, the surface of Mars, trying to understand all types of different things, like the geomorphology, the geology, where to So it's very much curiosity driven. Very much, yeah. Water, water's at the heart of the question, though. Yeah. I mean, the whole mantra for, for Mars exploration is, is follow the water because yeah. water and life are, are paired as, as essential relationships. And so I think the opportunity to talk about liquid water um, raises the whole uh, spectrum of, of you know, the range of potential water types on Mars. Mm -hmm. and, and it plays into this, this whole follow the water uh, mantra. As Richard said, um, there's lots of water on Mars um, and water that's probably far more accessible in terms of usability than the water that they're describing as the saline seeps on the, the hill slopes. Yeah. Um, the, the ground ice, the water that's just, um, I mean Phoenix exposed uh, snow or ice just a few centimeters below the ground surface and, and, the, and the polar ice caps are mainly the northern polar ice cap is a water-based ice cap. That water is far more accessible than the salt water. And the other interesting thing about this finding is, is we know that there's, there was abundant water, liquid water in the past. So for instance, um, in, in the uh, media frenzy, there was also a paper released by the, the, the team working with the Curiosity rover mm -hmm. talking about lakes on, on ancient Mars. So, you know, yeah. 3.5 billion years or, or so ago. Um, but we now have this data point from today which shows very, very salty water. But so that's, there's a timeline there where Mars went from being very wet to just maybe a little tiny bit of very salty water today. So we don't necessarily have to go back, you know, three and a half billion years to get to a place where it was, it was wet. Maybe yeah. rocks that are a billion years record wet environments, or maybe rocks that are 50 million years, or who yeah. knows? We don't, we don't know. So uh, there's an evolution there that took place. I don't think that the, the, the seeps that were, have been very recently discovered that probably contain some type of liquid water in some way, manner, or form um, will be of great help for manned missions to Mars, but certainly they will um, uh, be of high interest for future robotic missions to Mars because we, for the first time we actually have a target where we could potentially detect a biosignature or, uh, or even uh, microbes that are still alive on the surface of You know Mars. where to look. Yeah, we have a place to go to, and, and, and we've never had that before, really. So, and it's a specific place, a well-defined place, and uh, the amazing engineers at NASA and the European Space Agency have all kinds of wild and crazy ideas of how they can build uh, uh, tiny little mini rovers and spider-like things that can crawl up the side of these hills, and if they can just go and grab a sample and bring it back down to maybe the, the mother rover and then put it into the uh, instrumentation on board, uh, you know, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I think it, it's also a, a validation of the instrumentation they're using. Mm -hmm. and, and this is an important part of any space exploration program, is to prove that you're doing the right thing and using the right tools. And, and the fact that they're able to derive from the, the spectral data a, a liquid water signature tells NASA and the rest of the world they're on the right track. And, and that's very important too because it, it is a, uh, a, a success and proof driven system that mm -hmm. supports that kind of activity. Richard, you look at minerals. They yes. look at water, you look at minerals. What are you looking for on Mars and what, what do you hope it's gonna tell you? Right, well, um, looking at, uh, um, for instance, the minerals that were, that, that were found in this report that we're talking about, or the, the, the publication we're talking about. So they found a, a group of minerals called perchlorates. These are minerals that contain chlorine. And they're not super common on Earth, except in places like the Atacama Desert or Antarctica. So very dry uh, soils, uh, we find accumulations of perchlorates. And perchlorates act like antifreeze. They lower the freezing point of water. So uh, in terms of uh, cold, uh, life in cold conditions, we could theoretically have organisms living in water at minus 20 or maybe minus 30 degrees. Um, theoretically, we don't know that. Uh, yeah. occurs yet. Minerals and rocks always tell a story. I, I like to say a rock always tells a story and, and, and that's what geologists and geochemists try and do is tell those stories from the rocks. The, the, the liquid water question and, and in terms of uh, the different types of uh, freezing depression is, is really a big part of the story because Mars is cold. 
I mean, the mean temperature of Mars, what, minus 60, isn't that the, the mean temperature? It, it's cold year-round, and we only have a few places on Earth that we can go to to ask the sorts of questions we ask about Mars and to try and, and examine a place on Earth that might give us some of those answers. And the Arctic and the Antarctic are obvious places. And there's a place in Antarctica called Don Juan Pond. And Don Juan Pond is a, is a hyperchloride, it's a calcium chloride solution. And it's still liquid at minus 50 degrees. Uh, nothing can live in it. it you know, there have been reports. Well, Lyle of, hasn't been there yet. No, well, no. The others, ha others <laughs> have. Found things others have. Places. Yeah. And, and it's been a really significant debate, but it's just toxic. It's absolutely toxic. Mm -hmm. I mean, any, anything that gets in there, the salts would suck whatever moisture was in the organism. Can you give us some the stats on the organism that you found up in the Arctic? How salty is the water, but you found living filaments there, so. Yeah, well, we've, um, well, we work with, with Wayne, and uh, we have, we've, we isolated one organism from permafrost on Ellesmere Island, uh, and uh, we studied it extensively, and it will grow, and what I mean by that, by reproduce at, at least minus 15 degrees C in an 18% uh, salt solution, and it will metabolize, breathe like you and I, I do, at down to at least minus 25 degrees C. And uh, so that's, that, that's the sort of organism um, that I really get excited about. So that's minus 25 max, and you're talking about minus 60. As a mean, Mars. as a planetary temperature. Yeah. Okay. But the, the, the temperature, you know, there, that's the average planetary sure. temperature, but there are places on Mars that certainly get warmer than I minus 60. Yeah. yeah, and they might even get to, I'm, I'm not sure 20. how warm. At least minus 20, uh, even. Sure, yeah, it goes above zero, yeah. Yeah. right? Near the Please. equator in the yeah. summer, yeah. in the day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so we, we've, we've, uh, uh, We've had organisms that we've isolated from uh, other places as well, including these very uh, unique cold saline springs uh, near the McGill uh, Arctic Research Station. Um, and many of them will grow at sub-zero temperatures and also uh, at very, very salty conditions. The real question about the seeps for me is, what is the source of the water that is being bound to these salts? Mm -hmm. And uh, no one really knows that. Uh, it's possible it's just being sucked out of the atmosphere um, and if that were the case, then it would not be as interesting for me as a potential place where microbes could exist. It's just still too very harsh on the surface of Mars. The other possibilities are that there um, is an aquifer, a subsurface ground source, and it's just basically coming up like uh, the springs that we have at, uh, at, at the McGill station, um, some form like that. And that's much more interesting because what it really does is you know, I, I can't envision any microbes can, can, that can actually live on the surface of Mars even today and that would live a long time in that mm -hmm. briny seep that we've discovered on Mars very mm -hmm. recently. But if it was water coming from the subsurface, this would be, it would be depositing uh, potential microbial ecosystem or cells onto those salts and we could detect that. Let's, let, I want to get Tracy in here, finally. Yeah. Tracy, you study galaxies and the formation of galaxies, and recently you had a fascinating paper. You're looking at the edge of the universe. I mean, tell us what that looks like and, and what you found. Well, I can show you what it looks like. Awesome. Yeah, and I can tell you just a little bit about it. it the discovery itself is has basically two layers to it. One is the actual discovery of the galaxy cluster. Galaxy clusters themselves are quite common, but what is so exciting about this one is it's so far away. And so when galaxy galaxies or galaxy clusters are seen at such large distances, we're literally seeing very back in time. So this particular cluster is really fascinating because we're seeing it at such an early time or such a large distance. And one of the goals of my research is to understand how things like galaxy clusters formed. And so seeing them at early times is seeing them at an earlier epoch. Um, what, what did you see here that had not seen before. So this particular cluster has, as is described, um, as you described, a bursting heart. Um, and in what we mean by heart is that every, almost every galaxy cluster that we know of has a very, very massive galaxy in its center. We call this imaginatively the brightest cluster galaxy. And for a a long time, we haven't really understood how these brightest cluster galaxies formed. They're so massive and they're so different from every other galaxy out there that we know that they must have formed in a different way. Um, but the further back in time we look, they always look the same, they always look big, they always look old. And so it's been a real conundrum um, as to when and how they, were, they really formed most of their mass. And so what we found in this particular cluster is one of these brightest cluster galaxies undergoing a humongous starburst. 
technically it's forming hundreds and hundreds, 800 to be exact, um, stars per year, which is probably hard to put into context, but our own galaxy is only forming about three solar mass sol suns per year. Um, so this one is orders of magnitude. 800 suns forming 800 suns per year. Per year. It's really hard yeah. to wrap our brains around so, these numbers yes. and this distance. I mean, do you have an analogy for any of this to be relatable? It's really hard to get a handle on just how... How far away. Yeah, I don't have a good analogy for how far away it is. Um, you know, what I can say is that the light has been traveling for 10 billion years um, to get to us. And so this, this beautiful galaxy cluster and this beautiful galaxy in the center which is so active in the image that we're showing, um, is probably a very different place today because it's had 10 billion years to evolve um, since, we, since we took that picture, essentially. And you're saying that it's at the edge of the universe? It is near the limits of what we can actually see. And so you can describe the edge of the universe as that distance from which light has had time to travel to us since the beginning of time. And we can't see beyond that. Um, and With our tools today? No, or we just can't we just see beyond can't it. see beyond that because we have not the light there's light traveling to us from those regions of the universe but it hasn't had time to reach us yet um, someday it will there's light that has not reached us yet that will reach us tomorrow and that makes the edge of the universe a little bit further away but what does it tell us about our galaxy so our galaxy is quite a small galaxy compared to this one one of the things it is showing us is that um, well I'll just mention that we think the reason why this um, galaxy is forming stars so rapidly is because it swallowed another massive galaxy. And it's basically stolen all of its raw fuel. Um, and we think that this is a very common way of forming galaxies and making them bigger. Um, and is probably a similar, probably a similar event has happened to our own galaxy sometime in the past as well. Um, and probably every galaxy out there. Um, so now we're getting to see it really close up on a really big stage because this is just one of the most massive galaxies in the universe. And apart from the curiosity, does it inform us in any way about life on Earth? Not life on Earth, no, because it's too far away for us to see any planets or even to see individual stars. Um, we see all of the light from the billions of suns, um, billions of stars within this galaxy cluster coming to us all at once. Um, and we can't, as I say, detect things like planets. It's just too far away. It, it does inform us in the sense that it puts the Earth in perspective. So as I've just mentioned, this one galaxy, which is one of the most massive galaxies in the universe, has billions and ten, tens of billions of stars within it. Um, and we're now learning that most stars have planets as well. This is something that these guys know more about than I do, probably. And, um, and so there's potential for billions and billions of planets in this particular um, galaxy system. And so there's probably life there, possibly even looking back at us, seeing our galaxy go through a similar phase, maybe. Fascinating. So where do you take all this research as we continue to look for life out there? Just jump in. Where, where are some, what are some of the primary questions that we need to look at or that people are looking at? Well, you know, I, I like to say that Mars, although we've been, you know, going to Mars for, for, for 40 years or so now, uh, although not very often, but um, uh, it keeps throwing, throwing us surprises. You know, we, we think we know it, it's a cold, dry place, but we keep discovering new things either today or things that occurred in the past. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, pl it's a planet, it's big. Not as big as the galaxy, but it still has a lot of places you can go to, and, and it's so it's it's got different environments. It's heterogeneous. It's 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 got diverse features, and uh, so we've only really scratched the uh, the surface. And uh, so uh, in terms of Mars, uh, there's plenty more to do. Now there's other places we'd like to go to as yeah. well. Such as yeah. Um, well, I think I think it's going to be a tremendously exciting time in the next 20, 30 years for uh, planetary science and planetary exploration because we will be sending some robots or manned missions to Mars in let's say in the next 10, 20, 30 years that may actually detect life or not. And we have these other places in our, in our solar system. Uh, there's a couple small moons. Um, they're basically frozen ice balls. One's called Europa and it's, it's uh, uh, in, in part of the Jupiter system and one's called Enceladus. It's part of the Saturn system. And we know that these small moons have 
oceans of liquid water beneath their very, their, their, their surface is completely ice and they have these oceans uh, or large bodies of uh, salty water. In some cases there's even geysers spewing out water into, uh, into space. So these are other places that we will probably know a lot more about or be sending probes and so on and so forth. Again, over the next 10, 20, 30 years that will start uh, giving us a lot more information about the possibility that, that uh, different types of life could exist in such systems. I think one of the most important things about Mars, though, as a target is that it will demonstrate our capability to travel beyond our own planetary, you know, presence, mm -hmm. you know, the Earth and Moon. And, and so far, uh, not travel back. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've, we can send, um, uh, ro you know, rovers and, 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 and orbiters. Um, but to, to put a human on, on Mars, I think is going to be one of those. I mean, if you look back to the Apollo missions and even further back to the Mercury missions, the, the, uh, the hardware that we sent people to the moon in uh, today would be written off as unsafe. Um, and uh, I, I think we probably have the technology to put people on Mars. Now, there's many well-positioned you know, scientists that say that, um, but can we do it safely? And can we bring them back? No. And, and I think we have an obligation, an ethical obligation, to, to have a complete opportunity to go there, do what we need to do, and come back. Um, I think any mission that's considered a one-way mission is, is probably more hype than it is reality. Um, and I was going to ask you about what you think of the Mars One. I think, it's, I think it's more hype than reality. <laughs> it's definitely more hype than reality. Yeah. 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 What do, you, what do you think about it? You're working on all kinds of different Mars things with yeah, NASA. Yeah, I, mean, um, I, I don't think too much about it, um, although I keep getting asked about it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, someone has this idea and they're trying to hype it and they're trying to raise funds. And, um, uh, I, you know, one of the things I always get stuck on is when they describe, you know, these people who will go to Mars, they will live and work on Mars. And I always ask, you know, well, what are they going to do? And then people throw out, oh, they're going to do science. And, and uh, well, you know, what is that science? And do we need to send people to do that? And there's this long-standing debate between, you know, robots and humans and who could do better, you know, science or, or better investigations on Mars or on, on the moon or on any other planetary body. And uh, it's, it's... As long as they don't Twitter. <laughs> Let me ask each of you, why is this research important? For someone watching who might be a little skeptical about the expense of research like this, why? Each of you take a stab at that. Why is it important? Uh, well, the, actually, the money gets spent on Earth, first of all. Uh, <laughs> just you. as an aside. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, if, for me, it's, it's always been uh, an astrobiology question that, the, that we could have life Simple life, microbial life, which for as a microbiologist, I don't believe is all that simple. It's like it's very uh, interesting and, and uh, complex life in many uh, different different ways. So, but um, it, it's a very much a philosophical uh, uh, type of uh, 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 thing that drives me to do this. Let's say, and that, that that if we could find some type of life on some place else in our solar system, I think that'd just be tremendously exciting. And uh, it would probably mean, for me anyways, that there's the chance that there's life all over the galaxy and uh, so on and so forth. Hmm. How likely do you think life is out there? Well, I come at it from a different perspective, which is one of just numbers. Um, I, in my field, have a very intuitive feeling of how big the universe is and how full of stuff it is and how little we know about it. Um, and so for me, although we only have one data point, of life, it seems, it seems ridiculous to me that there would not be other life out there. What form it takes, mm -hmm. I have no idea, and I, that's really just based on my own, um, my own opinion and my own feeling about the universe. Wayne, I think there's there's two sides to the or two avenues to this the whole space exploration question, and I think the life one is really important. And and when, and I'm not saying if, I'm saying when we have hard evidence of of life outside Earth, it's going to change a lot of the way we look at ourselves. Um, it's going to change sort of the rules of, of our culture in some ways. And you know, we can think of religion, we can think of many ways, but it's going to change a lot. I think it's also the test bed of technology. And, and I think this is an, a, 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 an often overlooked aspect of the value of space exploration is the technologies that we're developing, the efficiencies in, in terms of energy and, and lightweight materials and, and being able to, to operate under extremely hostile conditions. Um, 
is stuff that ultimately finds its way back into society. And, and there's so many things that we could draw direct lines to that have benefited society. Interesting. And you're working a lot with Mars technology. Yeah, I, I, I work with a technique called the laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. Okay, so it's sure. basically firing a laser at a rock and, okay. and, and you get a little spark, a, a little bit of light, and you can measure the, the, the spectrum of that, of that light. And uh, the, the spectrum of that light is made up of all the uh, elements that are present in your sample. And uh, so this is the, the first time it's used on, a, on another planet. So this is the ChemCam instrument. It's going to be used on another Mars rover in, uh, Mars rover in 2020. Uh, and uh, this is also a, a, a technique that we're trying to um, uh, um, transfer back to Earth right. and use, for instance, in mining exploration. And uh, we could instrument a drill and actually measure rocks as we're drilling down and not necessarily have to take a core out and then send it back to a laboratory and so on. So these are our, our terrestrial applications of, of things that were really driven by the need to go to another planet and, and uh, make some really complicated uh, investigations there. And do you expect to find life out there? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the big questions, right, of humanity. We're not yeah. the first ones to ask that. So uh, I'm certainly happy to be part of, of those who are trying to answer it. Awesome. Thank you all very much for joining us. Thank and we get a little bit of a taste of, of your research and exploration. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you for joining us. We hope you'll join us next time. McGill Talks.